Welcome to this week's edition of World Stories. Poland preparing for the worst. Germany drawing fire. But we begin the show in the United States. Over 200 people were killed by firearms in the Washington DC metro area last year. Many of them young Afro-Americans. Malek was just one week shy of his 16th birthday when a stranger shot him in the neck on a public bus following a teenage spat. His mother Sharon sat by his bedside in hospital for four days and nights. Then, three days before his birthday, Malek's brain failed and the machines were turned off forever. Sharon remembers the last time she spoke to her son. It was a good moment. He was meeting me at my daughter's school and he came and, you know, gave me a big hug, told me he loved me and, you know, then went on his way and I went on to work and I just never knew that was going to be my last hug from him and kiss from him, but um, that's how he always greets me or that's how he always leaves me with a big hug and kiss and tells me he loves me. So that was the last time that I greeted him. There is no morning when Sharon does not wake up without tears in her eyes. What does she feel when she thinks about her son's murderer? And can a jail sentence ever bring justice? It's hard to put years on my son's life because my son will never come back. And, um, but that's the only thing that they can do is give him years. So that's, It's just hard. <laughs> At the end of every year, Lisa DeLitty writes on T-shirts the names, dates of birth and death of each person who has been shot dead during the last 12 months. It's a transportable political memorial, which DeLitty plans to install outside churches in Greater Washington next year. There'll be a shirt for Malek, too. Each T-shirt represents a human being, and I have a problem with the Congress that doesn't remember that there are human beings being killed by these guns, that there are mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers who are not with us anymore because someone had easy access to a gun, and that we need to do something about. There seems to be little in this bitterly contested election year that could offer some hope to parents like Sharon that they won't have to live in fear of losing another child to gun violence. NATO has been conducting maneuvers in Poland and for the first time Polish paramilitary forces will be given a role. Part of Warsaw's strategy to counter what it sees as a growing threat along its eastern border with Russia. A quiet courtyard in Wroclaw. Inside, a small apartment, a meeting place for this group of friends. They're studying security policy and international relations. Today, like every weekend, they're preparing to spend their free time doing military exercises. We're getting our equipment together. The backpacks, the guns, the ammunition. Now we're going to check that we have everything and that it'll all work properly when we get to the drill ground. Good preparation is really important. Their military equipment, including arms and ammunition, are just imitations. But at the training ground, they take the exercises very seriously, despite the 35-degree heat. The group is off to a forest about 15 kilometers outside of Wroclaw. They organize and finance these trips themselves. In the run-up to this week's NATO summit, the Polish government has announced it wants to integrate the country's 40,000 volunteer soldiers into its new national defense plan. They'll become a recognized part of the Polish army. This interest in national security has become a kind of trend, particularly among young people. We want to make the most of that. But these different groups are operating on very different levels, from the equipment they have to the exercises they do. It's all dependent on their own funding. That's why the Defense Ministry wants to provide financial support to bring standards in line. We believe in the principle, if you want peace, prepare for war. 
The Wroclaw students have been practicing drills in the blazing sun for hours. For them, the potential enemy is clear. Like most Poles, they believe that if it came to it, the threat would come from the east. Putin definitely poses a danger. I don't know if it would really come to an attack, but if it did, we'd all be ready to defend Poland. After the NATO summit, the Defence Ministry wants to provide financial support for the paramilitary groups. Everyone who officially registers as a defender of the nation and takes part in training exercises will get the equivalent of 120 euros a month. That's good news for the students from Wroclaw. Germany now and the political cartoonist Zuna from Malaysia. Back home, he has been charged with sedition and faces a lengthy prison sentence for lampooning his country's leaders. But he's refusing to be cowed. Sightseeing in Berlin. But Zukifli Anwar Ulak from Malaysia is not a typical tourist. He's here to garner support. Using the pseudonym Zunar, he published caricatures critical of the government in his native country. Now, he could face a 43-year prison sentence. It is a duty for cartoonists to expose corruption and injustices uh, in, in anywhere, in, including in Malaysia. Zunar is famous in Malaysia. He recently tweeted his support for an opposition politician. For the authorities, that was apparently the last straw. He was charged and could now end up in jail for decades for alleged subversive activities. The law that this verdict is based on harks back to the colonial era. His caricatures are caustic, regardless of whether they address corruption or restrictions on press freedom. He refuses to be silenced. Yes, I have fear. I'm going to face 43 years uh, jail. I have fear. I am human like anybody else. But if you ask yourself, which is bigger, fear or responsibility? For me, responsibility is bigger than fear. That's why he continues to fight for himself and for freedom of expression. In Germany, he is meeting with foundations, politicians and NGOs. His objective is to gain international attention and to avoid prison. Zunar is no isolated case. In 2015, eight other journalists were arrested, and in February, Malaysia's largest independent online newspaper was blocked. In the Global Press Freedom Index, Malaysia ranks in the bottom quarter. Zunar will also travel to Britain and Australia to seek support. It's important for me to, to keep telling myself that I'm not alone. So I have people uh, uh, around the world now supporting me. So this is, this is the strength that I will carry when I go back to Malaysia. His trial is set for September. If Zunar loses, this could be his last visit to Berlin. Our last report takes us to Africa. Cycling is a popular sport in Rwanda. We take a look at one young athlete who is regularly ahead of the pack, also internationally. Meet Jeanne d'Arc Giribontou, who inspires other women to fight for their dreams. It's early morning at the headquarters of Rwanda's cycling team. Jeanne d'Arc Giribontou is warming up, together with the other cyclists. They have three to four hours of training ahead of them in Rwanda's hills. Jeanne is the only woman in Team Rwanda. And last year, she was the first black African woman ever to ride at the UCI Road World Championships. I can only tell other girls and women, love the sport and believe in your potential. I never thought that I would cycle in the USA or Switzerland. I heard about those places, but I didn't know what it was like there. I've been able to travel and meet lots of people. Jeanne is ambitious. She needs competition. There are no other women who are at her level, so the trainer lets her cycle with the men. 
She just suddenly turned up with a lot of talent, and she seriously wanted to be a cyclist. And she's not only a good cyclist with prospects, she encourages other women in Rwanda and Africa to do sports too. A visit to her home village, a long way from the training center. Bikes are ubiquitous here too. Jeanne has just come from an international competition in Morocco. She tells her mother that she has two days before she gets back to training. It used to be difficult for me to make ends meet. I also had to pay for her bus fares. And when the bicycle was broken, I had to help her with money to get it repaired. Today, Jeanne is able to help her family out with the money she earns from cycling. She gets almost 1,000 euros a year as a member of the national team. For Jeanne, there's nothing better than coming back to visit her family. She comes to see them every three months. I'm really happy to see my friends. I really miss them. It's important for me. This way, when I get back, I can concentrate on the competition and don't have to keep thinking about when I'm finally going to see them. Jeanne has been cycling for Rwanda's national team in Africa for two years. Now she wants to take part in races in Europe. She says there are more competitions for women there, and she hopes that her biggest dream will come true to cycle for Rwanda in the Olympics.